Hi, welcome to this week's graphics programming virtual meetup. Uh, we follow the Berlin Code of Conduct. We have a Discord, you should join. Ask us for a link. We have a Twitter you should follow, which we post updates about what we're doing every week. And we have a YouTube channel, which we upload all of the meetings, specifically the presentation part of it for future reference. So this week we're starting a new series on the Vulcan Mini Path Tracer tutorial. And we're gonna be covering chapters one through three, which is about the initialization and uh, of Vulcan and the tutorial itself, as well as the memory, or at least a bit of it. So a link to the tutorial, yeah, um, copy and put this in the chat. Where's the chat? Okay, never mind. Um, and the source code for it is a GitHub repository, so you can download the source for it right there. So because this is a Vulkan-based tutorial, it's probably, it's definitely going to take a couple of chapters to get anything presenting to the screen that you can actually see. So this is a preview of what we're going to be doing. Because it's a path tracer, it means we're using the path tracing algorithm to generate our images. And the Vulkan API, we're going to be using is the Vulkan API. So first we need to set up Vulkan. Um, but before we get to that, we need to discuss what hardware can support or can run this tutorial series. Broadly speaking, if you have a RTX series GPU, that's the 2000 and up, you're good to go because those support the, all the ray tracing things. If you have a 1060 with gig, six gigabytes, you can do some of the tutorial, but not the way it's written originally. There's an additional chapter about how you do it. And it's not actually accelerating it. It is simply using a software implementation fallback. Um, oh, let me open the chat so I can read it. Um, prerequisites. The, I would say a, a basic idea of what graphic theory is, like you know what a triangle is, what a mesh is, what an image that you render to is. Um, but as far as Vulkan knowledge, you don't need any prior Vulkan experience. Heck, you could even do without OpenGL or DirectX experience and be mostly okay as long as you follow the tutorial. Um, so that's, that's helpful to know. Um, so the other thing is, if you're following along with the tutorial, every chapter has a checkpoint, like this is what the code should look like at the end of the chapter. That way you can compare your code that you've written in while you're following the tutorial with the one the author has written. And well, you could copy and paste it if you wanted, but it's really there to serve as a, okay, did you do it as to what the tutorial said you should, or did you miss something? It's also incredibly useful if you make messed something up, you can look at the checkpoint and go, oh, huh, that's wrong. And then you can fix it, hopefully. And that's the having checkpoints is so incredibly helpful for making tutorials uh, user friendly because you don't have to rewrite the entire thing from the top to bottom. You can just take the last checkpoint and run it and see the final output. Uh, I, I definitely appreciate that about the author. So as far as the software things you need, you need a C++ 14 compiler, you need Git to download the uh, software. You need CMake to build it. And last but not, um, you also need the dr a driver which supports the ray tracing hardware capability, ray tracing software. Well, you need a driver that was released past December 15th of last year. Um, NVIDIA released their driver pretty much the day of on Windows but mainline Linux support is taking a little bit of time, though I think I remember seeing a headline saying it's in the most recent NVIDIA Linux driver version. And not just a beta driver, but a full regular release. You also need the Vulkan SDK, which is, um, incidentally, I work for Lunar G, which makes the Vulkan SDK, so that's partially why I'm giving this tutorial. But you need version 1.2.162 because that contains the header files for the release uh, for the, the version which has the software we need. 
If you want the links for it, it's in the tutorial. So downloading the project, we just use git clone. Um, you navigate to a folder, open it in terminal or command line, and then run that. If you're on Linux, it's a shell. If it's on Windows, it's a bat file. Then we want to use CMake. Um, I'm not a fan of the CMake GUI, but I appreciate it because it's very specific as to what you need to do. You have to launch the CMake GUI, however you normally would do that. You need to find the source code folder, which is here uh, demonstrated, as, and then you need to put a source for the, you need to put a folder for the build files to go. And then you click configure. This configures the project, meaning it looks through the CMake list file and then figures out everything it needs it needs to do, but it doesn't do it yet. Then you can set which uh, generator to use, which is in this case, in on Windows at least, Visual Studio. And once that is found, you can use it to generate the project, which generates a Visual Studio file, a video, Visual Studio solution. Open the solution and then we can configure it. Now, there really isn't any configuring to do inside Visual Studio other than to set the project we're going to use to the VK Mini Path Tracer uh, edit. That is the uh, scratch space where you are going to actually be implementing it. Um, you'll want to be running in debug mode just because that way if you do mess something up, the, you can easily debug it as well as other validation and other things can happen. If you want to compile and run the other other chapters, they're right there on the, in the list of targets that you can easily select and run and whatnot. <laughs> but now we have our build environment set up. We can actually start coding. So if we open up the mini path tracer edit file, or the main.cpp in the mini path tracer edit target, we can copy and paste this code, which includes the necessary helper. We have our main function. And then we have this block of text, which I'll describe momentarily. But if we compile and run it, it should print out some useful information about your GPU and your CPU and your installation. Um, I won't copy and paste that because it's frightfully boring to look at. And it will depend on what capabilities and features you have on your GPU. So um, it wouldn't even be the same. So. Now that we have something running, let's take a step back and have, look at what we have. So Vulkan is a graphics API. It is the thing you talk to the GPU with. But you don't talk directly to the GPU. The GPU is a piece of silicon with registers, memory, uh, silicon chips, and all sorts of things. Um, we need a driver to drive it, just like we need a USB driver or a webcam driver or any other sort of hardware. Um, the GPU driver is what implements the graphics commands and then turns it into whatever information it needs to send to the GPU. Um, this is done across the PCIe bus because the PCIe bus is what bridges the hardware of the GPU to the silicon of the CPU. Now, we also don't talk, we, our application does not directly talk to the GPU driver, and this is mainly done for, well, ease of updating and managing different applications. Um, if your application needed to talk directly to the driver, you'd have to figure out some way to get the functions from the driver directly, and you'd have to have an interface that's forever set in stone. What instead has happened is there is a Vulkan shared library that sits in between the two. Now, the main purpose of this is to facilitate communication between the two, but the real benefit of having a static or a dynamic library in between it is that you can have multiple GPU drivers and you only have to have one shared library to talk to all of them. And it can, that shared library can have all the guts and needs to make it work. So when you actually call a Vulkan function, you call into the shared library that calls into the driver, and that does all the work and then returns back to you. And there's this whole just chain of events. But that, con that library wouldn't be very useful if we didn't have some way to actually talk to it. What we 
don't want to do in this tutorial is describe every excruciating process of getting to that shared library, initializing it, and in using it. Instead, we're going to use the tutorials helper nvbk context. This object, once created, has set up all of the implementation that you would have to write yourself otherwise. So it's going to be the VK instance, the VK physical device, the VK device, and even the queues. Uh, I will talk about the instance, physical device, and device in later slides. But really, it's just super convenient to have a single function call, context.init, and it does everything. Now, I, I do want to point out that there is context create info, which you feed into the context init, and that is just information you set up beforehand to say, hey, this is stuff I need to do. Right now we don't have anything in it, but we, we do need the, the context create info object at least. Uh, coincidentally, that is, if you start writing Vulkan API, just straight go ham, no tutorial, no um, helpers, it's a very similar pattern where you create a struct that is a create info, you fill it out with your details, and then you pass it into a Vulkan function. So it's, it's a very similar um, you know, means of initializing objects. So VK instance, what is a VK instance? It is really just a context, a, in, in effect, global context. But you create a single instance and you can access all of Vulkan through it. It has a couple of parts that you can customize before you create the instance, namely, well, information about the instance you're creating, say like the application name and the version you want, but also you can select which layers you want enabled as well as what instance extensions. So a Vulkan layer is a bit like a plugin, except instead of being off on its own, you know, plugs into the architecture, it's more of an interception. So whenever you call a Vulkan function, it goes into the shared library that then calls into the driver. Well, a layer can intercept that. So when you go call a function, you don't just call the function in the shared library, the shared li the, the you call into the layer and then the layer calls into the driver, then the driver returns calls back into the layer and then calls it back into your, or returns back into your application. This is incredibly useful if you want to you know, facilitate validation where you s check all of the arguments to see if they're correct or not or if you're making sure that the user isn't in giving it bad data uh, the application isn't giving the driver bad data and in fact the vk layer chronos validation is the official validation layer that handles all sorts of um, things that you wouldn't immediately remember because there's hundreds of thousands of little things to remember. I mean, it will check them all for you, you know, all the, make sure all the types are right in the art, well, not the types. Um, make sure all the arguments to the, all the functions are what they should be, at least according to the spec. Um, and this layer is uh, so effective that the API was designed such that you don't need, if you don't enable a layer, there is basically zero error checking. Unlike with OpenGL and DirectX 11, I believe, um, or, in, or just other drivers in general, the layer, uh, the, the application, if it started giving it bad data, the driver would have to catch it and go, hey, stop, you shouldn't be doing that. In Vulkan, the driver simply does not have any sort of validation code inside of it which makes it a lot easier and faster to write. Um, so in, in short, you should use the la Kronos validation layer always when you're doing development with Vulkan. The nice thing about the context he the helper is that it automatically enables it if you have debug mode or the if you have a debug configuration for your uh, application. So, you know, there's the debug and release mode. If you're in debug mode, it will turn it on. Um, you can turn it off. Uh, there's context pre info, the constructor argument has a parameter for it. There are other uses for layers like overlay, capture, replay, logging, but validation is the main one. So, extension, oh, yeah, we have an example. So, we have set up our context and then we make a Vulkan call 
except these two arguments should not be null pointer. The spec says they should be something valid. This should be a real number and then a, a real pointer. Since we didn't do that, the validation layers yell at us. They yell at us a lot. And I can tell you VK allocate command buffer required parameter P allocate info was null, but it shouldn't be. So that's an example of the, out, the output of it. So an instance extension extends the capability of Vulkan. They are the mechanism in which the API can keep adding stuff without breaking stuff in the process. Uh, they also are required for presentation because the core Vulkan specification does not have a way to present to the screen. It is all through an extension, which is awesome because if you're doing something that's headless, meaning you're not presenting to the monitor, you're just right, you're doing stuff on the GPU and then reading it back and saving it to a file, which is what this tutorial does. You don't actually enable anything with the, the screen. Uh, there's also a debug callback extension, VK XD debug utils. This is enabled for you by default uh, through the helper context. Um, other things like GPUs, uh, multi GPU, and other stuff are extensions. Note that these are instance extensions. They are not device extensions, which is an important distinction. Uh, effectively, they, all, they apply to the entire instance or the entire application, as it were. But oh, so now that we have an instance, we can create a we can query the physical devices of the system. The physical device is a physical piece of hardware. The main purpose of a VK physical device handle is just to query information about that physical device and then to create a VK device from it. You can imagine a physical device as a, just a, you know, a hardware descriptor. Like this, there are five hardware pieces on the system. If you want to use that hardware piece, you have to create a context on it, which we call a VK device. And that's a logical device, as it were. A, so like if there were five Vulkan applications, all of them would have the same VK device for the same GPU, but each of them would have its own logical device. And that's what the, lo the logical device is what they use to communicate with the GPU. So chapter two, device extensions and Vulkan objects. Before we get to the device extensions, we do want to make sure that we're using Vulkan version 1.2. Vulkan has three minor versions and one major version, version 1, 0, 1, and 2, or 0, 0, 1.0, 1.1, 1 .1, and 1.2. 1.2 has stuff we need, and so we're going to require it in our instance creation. We have our device info, API major, and minor, so that when we create a device, it makes sure that we have those capabilities there. We also need to include a couple of extra things, context and structs. These are helpers to uh, create stuff. So if you run the program, there should be something about the Vulkan version and the available means the shared library version and the requesting means we're gonna use my, the minor version two as a baseline. So we can, if it's a feature that only that is added in 1.2, we can use it. The next thing is a general style guy, style, a general aspect of Vulkan. So Vulkan is a C99 API. And because it's a C99 API, it's very limited in the programming capabilities that you can implement in such an API. One of those limitations is a generic uh, function interface as well as uh, you know runtime runtime type in uh, not interference information <laughs> there are several structs and in fact many of the structs with create info uh, I think both, all of them do they have an s type parameter this s type is the type of the struct, which seems very nonsensical because it's like, well, the type's right there. Why can't we, why can't you see it right there? And the, the reason we have this S type was just a 32-bit uh, int that stores a, an enum value. 
is if you we, there is a chain um, the driver it gets function calls these function calls have a pointer to a chain of structures this is called the pnex chain i don't have it typed up here um, but i'm realizing why i need to explain the s type as being important this pnex chain is a is a void star the driver does not know what what type the structure is by adding an s type parameter the driver can go oh this is a physical device ray query feature struct. Okay, I know where everything is going to be inside of this. And then it can go through this chain of void pointers. Um, explaining how to use it is a bit advanced for the, what this tutorial needs, but understand the S type is there for a reason. It isn't just because the API people are lazy or something. Um, the thing you have to remember is you need to always specify the S type. It's very annoying. There are a couple of ways to make it a little easier. One is this nbvk make. It is a function which returns the struct with the S type filled in. If you use auto, it makes it a single line and it's a bit prettier. Vulkan HPP does this for you automatically. Vulkan HPP is C++ bindings for the C API and all the structures in Vulkan HPP has the S type as a default parameter. Can't do that in C, so you have to fill it in manually. But the, this tutorial uses the C API just because it's, I guess, the most convenient. Um, although the HPP, this, the C++ bindings have a lot of nifty features in them that, in my opinion, are mostly worth uh, switching over. But it's a C API, so we'll just use this make thing to make it much easier. So actually back to the device extensions. So we need three, there are three ray tracing extensions that are specific to the device. Where before we were talking about instance extensions, now we're talking about extensions on the device. So capabilities that this device has that others may not. Um, and that's especially important for RTX uh, hardware, which has support for these uh, extensions. The three of them, being acceleration structure, ray query, and ray tracing pipeline. This tutorial uses ray query. Ray query allows you to do ray tracing from inside Compu and fragment shaders, I believe. Um, but they just is it allows you to use the ray tracing hardware from existing shader types. Ray tracing pipeline adds new shaders, new ray tracing specific shaders that allow you to do a lot of fancy things and are really necessary for doing some of the more advanced functionality, but for very basic usage as well as very specific things, say ambient occlusion, ray query is just fine. Acceleration structure is a requirement for both of those for extensions, as in if you enable ray query, you also have to enable acceleration structure. The acceleration structure extension adds, well, the ability to accelerate ray traversal. Uh, if you if you um, if you want to make ray tracing fast, you have to make ray traversal fast, and that's the mechanism which Vulkan does it. Now, as an added insult to injury, the ray tracing the acceleration structure extension requires another extension called VKKHR deferred host operations. So now we need three extensions enabled just to use ray query. Uh, the deferred host operations, I'm not gonna explain it. You can look at it in the tutorial. It's, it's a fun thing, but it's an implementation detail for what this tutorial is concerned about. So to enable them, there's again a helper, add device extensions, and we simply give it the extension name. It's really nice. But as I was mentioning earlier, there uh, we may want, no, I was not mentioning this earlier. Just because we enabled the FA extension, that doesn't mean we know what capabilities the hardware has. The way we can figure out what capabilities and features are is to add a features struct to the PNX chain of the device we're trying to create. There is thankfully a very helpful helper that does it. So all we have to do is create the struct and then pass a pointer to it 
um, what I was talking about earlier, the PNX chains, that's this feature in action where the, the application puts this structure in the PNX chain and then when the driver iterates over that chain, it goes, ah, I see the structure. I need to fill in all this information so that for the application to use. And we do this for both the acceleration structure and the ray query features. Um, this assert just makes sure that we can do what we want, which is that the features are in fact supported. These are VK true is a type alias, type alias, uh, pound define for one and zero. Uh, one being um, VK true being one, if I remember correctly. Um, you could use true, it would do the same thing, but since it's a C API, it's the C API. And C doesn't define bool, it defines underscore capital B O O L. Sorry, <laughs> I have opinions sometimes. So when we add this code, we now have a instance. If we have found a physical device that can support what we need. We've created a, cre a, a device and we're now able to actually use it to do stuff. Still though, we have a couple of steps left before we get to anything interesting. One of those steps is memory. We have to, um, we have to allocate all of our own memory. Before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the memory architecture of a GPU versus a CPU. CPU has its own RAM, GPU has its own VRAM or video memory. It is the same thing if not uh, optimized for GPU usage. Um, GPU, CPUs have DDR4 memory and GPUs have GDDR5 maybe or maybe 6x and that's just a specification but it's the same underlying technology as one's just optimized for GPU usage. We call it VRAM to delineate it because otherwise it's just RAM and it's very confusing to specify which one. There is a pretty fast interconnect between the CPU and the GPU, the PCIe bus, but it's nothing compared to the speed at which the CPU can address its RAM and the GPU can add talk to its memory. Um, so we want to do as little transferring data between the two processors as possible. Uh, not to mention there's a very high latency involved with doing any sort of communication. So the best way to use a GPU's memory is to transfer all the data you need at once, let the GPU do all the work it needs, and then transfer it back. And that's always going to be a thing you have to think about, whether you're doing uh, offline rendering, like for Pixar, whether you're doing a video game, whether you're doing uh, AI calculations, anything you're doing on the GPU, you have to worry about that transferring of data because that's a major bottleneck and it's not going to go away until we put the CPU and GPU on the same die, which is what mobile chips and mobile laptops do. So, but the fastest GPUs are all discrete external, so we get to deal with that. But on to Vul memory in Vulkan specifically. In Vulkan, the API does not expose a nice new and delete primitive or malloc and free. It gives you basically the building blocks you need to make your own new and uh, delete wrapper function. Uh, it's 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 lower level than what the C and C++ standard gives you in terms of memory allocation. It does it using VK um, device memory. This is a object that that's just a reference to a range of memory on the GPU. This object is, if you look at the implementation of a driver, the driver has only so many allocation slots available. And as you create, keep creating VK device memories objects, you keep um, using up this resource of alloc allocation resource. The Vulkan spec only mandates that a GPU support or a driver support 4,096 distinct device objects. So it behooves any application developer using Vulkan to create a 
a few very large device memory handles that you then subdivide individually. What you put in these subdivisions is your actual images and buffers. But since we're doing a pretty simple application, we're not going to use more than a handful of distinct memory allocations. So we're not going to hit that 4096 limit anytime soon. And we can create a uh, device memory object for every image and buffer we want. Um, this is something you can get away with in samples and tutorials and just small, very focused applications. But if you're writing a big fat game engine or rendering a framework that's you know highly complicated and very configurable, you will have to create some sort of allocator. Thankfully, there is one, a interface that the tutorial provides called the NBK allocator DMA, which does all the grunt work for you. There's also a VMA version of it that was a literally just an interface for the Vulkan memory allocator, a software library um, by the AMD people that's free and open source and I use it in my own Vulkan projects. And that is a implementation of new and delete, but written for Vulkan so that you don't have to have to worry about it. Um, the point of this slide is to detail a whole bunch of stuff that thankfully we don't have to think about a whole lot in terms of the underlying implementation details. We do have to know about what the memory is doing. We just don't have to care about where it's coming from as much. We're going to be using the, the DMA in our uh, project. So how, how do we use all that fancy stuff I just described? Well, we include the header. We need to define this because it's a single header file. And so this will, if you haven't heard of single header files, look it up, but it's a way of packaging libraries. Once we do that, we want to create, we want to have an allocator on it from it. And we just initialize it. And we have to initialize it with a physical device because it's specific to the GPU. <laughs> As, as, as usual, you should clean up when you're done with things. That's what we call D init. I didn't mention that earlier, but you should always clean up after yourself, even if the uh, operating system is going to take all your open handles and clear them out uh, once your program ends. But So if a device memory object is the raw underlying storage, then the Vulkan buffer is a logical allocation on top of it, except a, Vulk, a VK buffer itself is more like a pointer with a bit of additional information, specifically the size and the usage, um, usage flags, as they are called. <laughs> so if we want to create a buffer, we have to have a size and we have to have the usage we want. There's a couple of usages that we have here and you know storage buffer bit transfer destination bit these are things that we're going to be using this buffer for if we're say doing a traditional rasterized game we would want a vertex buffer then we would use vk buffer usage vertex buffer bit um, but since this is going to be for a path tracer we're not using the traditional rasterization pipeline at all we don't need that now the act of creating a buffer is just a function call. But once that, that, that function call doesn't have any memory backing it up, we have to manually bind the memory to it. So it's kind of like how a pointer in C and C++ by default is just null. There's, it doesn't point to anything. We have to make it point to something. Now, if you use malloc or new, it's going to call the operating system and the operating system gets you the memory and puts that pointer into the, well, the, the pointer. But in Vulkan, we have to do that ourselves manually unless we are using this tutorial, which has all these nice helpers that does it for us. So this allocator.create buffer not only creates a VK buffer object, which is a, a proper object that you have to call the Vulkan API to create, it also binds the memory to it. Um, well, actually, it first creates the memory and then binds the memory. Now, to create that memory from an allocator, there's a couple of properties we can consider. Um, 
these are the descriptions of what type and kind of memory it is. You can go down the rabbit hole and look at all the little noms and dials you can twiddle, but the most important things here are listed in that the visible bit, the cached bit, and the coherent bit. A visible memory means, a uh, host visible, I should say, means that the CPU can see it. That is very helpful if we're trying to transfer data from the CPU into the GPU and vice versa. Um, if we had, say, a one that isn't listed here called device local, property device local, then the GPU has complete access to it and the CPU is left out completely. The CPU does not know ex exists. This is the place you'd store GPU-only data or stuff that you once you finish transferring, the CPU doesn't care about. So if you're uploading stuff to it, you'd put it all in device local and then leave all the CPU would stop caring about it after it's been uploaded. But what we're using this buffer for is the image output. And so we want to be able to see it from the CPU. The cache bit and the coherent bit have to do with how the CPU can access it and whether it's synced or not. Um, the, the tutorial has a lot more text that describes all of that and I highly implore you to read it, but since we're already 30 minutes in, I, I'm gonna skip over it for now. But essentially you want all three of these properties if you're going to be reading data back from the GPU to the CPU, which is what we're going to be doing in a second. I mentioned earlier that we're gonna be using a buffer for our final image, which is a bit weird. If you already know Vulkan, you know that there's a thing called VK image and that you use it to do image things. Well, a buffer is just a byte array and, a G and an image for all we care about is also a byte array and the compute shaders and all the things that are gonna work and do all the ray tracing and whatnot are just they just see a big array of bytes and they're going to pull from it and write to it and that's all it cares about. There are definite advantages to using a VK image. It has a whole bunch of features and capabilities that are necessary for images like MIP maps, like layers, like quad, uh, not quad, cube maps, um, filtering options, all sorts of things that the GPU supports that would be useful if we were doing anything more complicated, but we aren't. And setting up an image is significantly more involved. There's, all, if you think this is a lot of code with all of these you know, properties, it would be about five times longer because there's just 10 different things you have to futz with to get an image into the right format with the right layout, with the right color. I can go on. Anyways, we make it simple. We, we don't want to think about that. We just use a VK buffer instead. Lastly, we have memory, we have an image, we found it, we put it on the GPU, and now we wanna get data out of it. <laughs> there are fancy ways to transfer data to and from the GPU, but the simple and easy, as it were, way is to map the, the VK buffer to the CPU's memory space. Um, this is how we're going to be transferring data from the GPU to the CPU. It's, I was thinking about how to explain this and I was realizing, wow, there's actually quite a bit of stuff going on to make this possible. Because if you look at this code, you see this magic function map, then you reinterpret the pointer to instead of being a void star to being a float star, and then you just address it like it's, on the CPU memory. Uh, suffice to say, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, but effectively you're turning a, you're, you're getting an address that when dereferenced goes through the driver, goes through the, or not through the driver, goes through the uh, PCIe bus, goes into the GPU memory, gets data and comes back out and gets to the GPU or to the CPU and the CPU can access it. Um, so is it slow? That's not a question I can answer. It's actually can be pretty fast. Uh, there are dedicated transferring methods, but they have additional setup involved. They have additional costs. And for what we need, we just want to get the data once it's done. We don't have a strong, oh my God, it's taking forever because we're not transferring an image that's a million 
pixels wide by a million pixels high. We're only doing like a thousand by a thousand. Um, so that's fine. And if we run the program, of which I've totally just glossed over actually implementing this, but whatever, we can see that we get data and the data is all zeros because we didn't write anything into that buffer. We just read from it, which is uninitialized. And you might think you should get random crap in here. And well, you might actually get random crap. I don't know. It's undefined what you get. But it's a GPU, so everything's generally zeroed out pretty well, at least for new applications. Like you will sometimes get fun stuff reading uninitialized memory. Anyways, we won't be leaving it uninitialized forever. What we'll implement in the future is a code that will write into that buffer and fill it with information. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Next week, we'll be talking about command buffers and finally writing that image, wait, no, to a file which means we'll take that image that we've copied from the GPU onto the CPU and write to a file so we can see it. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much. <coughs> yeah, very thorough presentation. Yeah, very good. Yeah, okay, well, I think we can end the presentation. We can just get into talking for a bit. <laughs>